in case you've been living under a rock this past week, uh, Quasi Quarteng's name's been in the news. It's been an unprecedented opening week for a chancellor, uh, if you exclude the previous chancellor, uh, Zahawi, of course, in this on-running uh, Tory escapade of 2022. But Quarteng is an interesting character in so much that he, um, he has written two books in particular which date from the first half of the 2010s it gives us a glimpse at a perception of the world and of the UK scene he inhabited which showed there is an intellectual endeavour there and there is some sort of a want of a mission and a meaning to his role in politics more than simply climbing the greasy pole. So in light of the chaos that has been unleashed from his mini-budget of September 2022, I thought it would be a good time to go back and look at these two books that that I read of his some seven and eight years ago. The books are namely Ghosts of Empire, first published 2011. Uh, it's an introspection on the British Empire and the daring do's and don'ts of the men and some women who, who helped uh, run it in various different colonies and mandates of it across the globe. The second is War and Gold, a centuries-wide view of monetary policy and debt accumulation, starting from the conquistadors and running up to the financial crash, and was written in, in lieu of wanting to find a larger scope view of debt and of financial crises after having lived through 2008-2009. So let's try and find out what Quartain is trying to say in these works and how much is he adhering to any of the convictions uh, as a chancellor or whether we can gleam uh, nuggets of his position through these works. Let's start with his conception of empire. No serious Englishman of intellectual prowess, be he recently arrived through immigrant background or is as old as the Groby Great Tree uh, in Ford's Braid's End, can ignore the weight of empire and the history of empire. Now, for a while during the sort of Blairiana of 97 to 2010, one could bury the empire under a schmaltz of cool Britannia, sprinkling of oasis versus blur. Quartain in 2011 emerges as a Tory, unseduced by these sort of Blairite overtures, despite Cameron coming in around the same time as the purported heir to Blair. So Quartain takes the imperial legacy seriously, and in Ghosts of Empire, he doesn't settle for an easy-picking narrative which um, is akin to today's prevailing orthodoxy, namely, Britain held the whip hand, and used it relentlessly. That the unassuming world was but spared her back. If she was but spared her back by this beating, the nirvana of a John Lennon's Imagine may be upon us present day. No, this thankfully um, is also spared in Quartain's treatment. So what are we left with? Well, Quartain provides us with a particular view of empire, which is heteroscedastic. It's, it's improvisational. He gives us six separate regional treatments and tries to show how individual actors, rather than a uniform top-down policy, drove uh, the colonial legacy, you know, the movement. And that is Quartain's first kernel of empire, right? On the one hand, there's lack of adequate oversight, and it leads to chaos. One actor cannot build upon another and create genuine cohesion, generation after generation, throughout the empire. But on the other hand, we see Quartain fall into a strange, rather romantic vista, where lack of oversight means blank canvas and a canvas for enterprise. And it's there where you start to see uh, some of his idealistic notion, uh, libertarian free market notions come into effect. Once the canvas is there for enterprise, great individuals impose themselves upon the scene. And you can almost start to think of this as positively Carlylean. Almost despite himself, Quartain 
goes into uh, the great man acting upon the world stage. In a certain sense, Quarteng's budget maintained an aspect of this vision, right? Trim the state and let great individuals emerge on this free canvas. Though it's proved an invocation, if we use Carlali in terms of rather a Kimmerian darkness, than uh, enter the living light fountain. And in this sense, Quarteng's falling into a uh, post carlalian fallacy. That even by trimming such things as in- income tax, reversing a, na- a national insurance hike, by reducing income and expanding the deficit, you are creating something via formula. Uh, you cannot create the canvas alone via formula. That, that goes against the Carlyle conception of, of the great man or just great actors in general. You cannot call, by virtue of a formulaic maneuver, the figure of imperial enterprise. The time calls him not, he calls his own time. That was a Carlyle truism. So this, for me, seems to have been the first reaction to Quarteng's mini-budget taken aback from the Carlylean perspective, is markets react to a man who's prescribing formula that is not their own formula. Quarteng may think he's doing otherwise, but that that is, in a nutshell, what the equation is. There is no great man, there is only a formula whereby Quarteng is deluding himself into thinking he's, he's freeing up the space for growth. Now, that's his conception of imperialism condensed into a short snippet for a video like this. But let's look at some samples from Ghost of Empires, because this is mainly a literary channel. And I wanted to see what uh, the actual phraseology, what the actual tone of Quarteng's Ghost of Empire was when he's talking about some of these uh, enterprising individuals. In his introduction... Quartang's words, quote, I've called this anarchic individualism in that there was often nothing to stop the man on the spot as he was called by the colonial office officials from pursuing the course of action he thought best. And that he tried to, Quartang, tried to transcend what he believed to be a rather sterile debate about merits and demerits in folks instead upon the actions of the man. In his introduction, he gives us his synopsis of Milner. The ultimate imperial civil servant was Alfred Milner, born in Germany in 1854, the son of a medical student who had married a widow 20 years his senior. Milner's background was obscure, but by dint of talent and industry, he ended up as Viscount and was elected Chancellor of Oxford University, though he died before he could be officially installed. In many cases, and he goes through that Milner chose the colonial office because he could get away from the party politic and get away from the electorate, more importantly. In many cases, they, these um, imperial administrators, they chose careers in the empire precisely because they were not Democrats. They were elitists, men who could write Latin and Greek epigrams and had sought to wield power without having to go through the inconvenience of being elected. The empire, yes, stood for order and the rule of law, but we must not pretend its character was something other than what it was. And then he goes on, Quartang, to say, that I contend that the example of the British Empire shows the opposite. Empires, through their lack of foresight and the wide discretion they give administrators, lead to instability and the development of chronic problems, a rather uh, unfortunate portend to the sort of instability he himself has invoked later on. So what are the six regions uh, Quarteng decides to look at? Well... Part one is obviously Iraq, oil and power. Written in 2011, the Iraq war would still be fresh on people's minds and he wants to hook in that um, that American audience with this book as well. We have to keep that in mind. During the Iraq segment of his book, he has to describe characters such as Sir Mark Sykes, out of the Sykes-Picot agreement. Sykes was not really trusted by the British government as he was considered to be too imaginative and dreamy, too exotic even. The only son of an eccentric Yorkshire baronet, he had influenced greatly by his mother, a Roman Catholic, who had a consuming passion for French culture and literature. It was said 
that she could have passed an examination in Balzac, and that she knew French literature as well as a Frenchman. So this is the sort of eccentricity that Quartang focuses on throughout his work. The caliber of the man in terms of his schooling also comes to the fore, but usually he will focus on the eccentricity and the fact that they are removed from the party politic. And this removal is reinforced when he talks about uh, Lord Curzon's line on creating the, the mandate of Iraq. Curzon had argued in a memorandum of December 1917 that there should be no actual incorporation of conquered territory, but the absorption should be veiled by constitutional fictions as a protector, as a sphere of influence, a buffer state, and so on. Behind these fictions, there existed much idealism about the British civilizing mission in the East. There was a genuine belief that British rule was better for Iraq than subjection to the rule of the Ottoman Turks. And still on the Iraqi piece, he talks about Gertrude Bell as an example of the liberal imperial. The Bells could devote their lives to liberal imperialism, while others did the dirty work of actually making money. And then Quartin goes into uh, his business acumen by detailing the uh, creation of Anglo-Persian oil and then its later fight with Standard Oil Company uh, from America and the ensuing uh, geopolitical wrangling that uh, that occurred uh, between the British, the French, the US, Ottomans, the Arabs, and so on in Iraq. But Bell, like Lawrence, he stresses as a liberal imperialist and he paints them as slightly naive. Quartain is more interested in the, in the realism in a certain sense than the, than the aloofness of Lawrence and Bell, but he respects in another sense the, 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 the Laurentian achievement Right. The Seven Pillars of Wisdom is still something that manifested itself through genuine action and will on the ground. And he's sceptical as well of the uh, emancipation story that is told in some of these colonies. Again, we look at Iraq, right? Despite overt nationalism, which we influenced by the present Nasser and Baathists of the 1950s anachronistically regard as a largely secular movement, there was a strong religious element to the uprising. And on the 1920 revolt as well, he places a sort of scorn on the mob. And again, we see that to be... Um, rather ironic, considering that it is the, the market and then the larger media mob that have come in for him uh, after his budget. So what other than Iraq does he look at? Well, he takes us through the acquisition of Kashmir in India, and then also onto the annexation of Upper Burma by Lord Randolph Churchill. And so Looking again at the implementation of that annexation of Upper Burma as, as a little vignette into Quarteng's language, here he is uh, talking about Lord Randolph Churchill. Against this constantly shifting background of domestic politics, a decisive character prone to bold gestures like Randolph Churchill could, in the absence of a determined opposition, affect the direction of the empire, as Gladstone himself remarked in a speech in the House of Commons at the end of January. 1886. Parliament usually prorogues at the end of July and meets again six months after, which had the result that the whole of the Burma campaign had begun and ended while MPs were still in their constituencies or country estates. Churchill had used the Crown's prerogative to annex the Kingdom of Burma, bypassing the House of Commons. Or uh, let's look at another case of when Quarteng is talking about administering the Sudan and the, the sort of character that was required there. Here he focuses on the, the necessity of the Oxford Blue, right? Someone who was strong and not only academically, but had performed in rugby or rowing, one of the stronger um, Oxford or Cambridge sports. The interview process, this is for someone administering in uh, Sudan was not particularly rigorous, but involved a series of questions designed to show mental toughness. Cranks and people with foreign accents were firmly rejected. When asked, what made you want to serve in Sudan? One candidate replied, I always wanted to serve in Sudan, sir, ever since seeing Tarzan of the Apes, the 1918 film. He was not selected. Wingate personally rejected another candidate. 
on the less substantial pretext that there was something Levantine about him, and as you know, that fact alone makes him undesirable. The public school ethos was overwhelming. Colonel Sir Stuart Symes, Governor General of the Sudan from 1934 to 1941, remembered that there was always a strong public school flavour about the members of the Sudan political service. In the early days before 1914, the average man in the service could be said to have a second in history from Oxford and a rugby blue. And then he continues to look at Nigeria, and there he focuses on more eccentrics, George Goldie, Lord Lughart, and then, of course, um, the creation of the Bi Biafra War through not a colonial man, but a colonially inspired and educated man, uh, Ajuku, who led the Igbo Rebellion in the beginning of the Biafra War. It was this time the Igbo leader, Chukwemeka Ajuku, military governor of the eastern region, suddenly emerges as a central character in the affairs of Nigeria. To the High Commissioner, he was a questionable figure about whose sanity there could be some doubts. Ajuku was an interesting man, the prime mover in the eventual succession of Eastern Region and the establishment of the nation of Biafra. He was the son of an Igbo businessman who had been described as the richest man in Nigeria and had, made, and had been knighted for his achievements. Sir Louis Ajuku had made money in the road haulage business in the 1940s. He then sold the business and invested the proceeds in the property, reputedly leaving a fortune of £8 million in his debt in 1966. So we're in the 60s. But then we move on to his son, Ajuku, where he was in Epsom College. And then the presence of Nigeria in a British private boarding schools, though commonplace by the 70s, was unusual in the 40s, and Ajuku remembered later that he'd been swamped by a sea of white faces. His powers of argument and charisma, that Quarteng again focuses on, won him a place in the debating team at Epsom. And Ajuku was remembered at Oxford as the happiest days of his life, where he drove around in a sports car, um, burning up the A40 between Oxford and London in an MG sports car. So this is, the, this is again, the peculiarities, the little details Quartain wants to pick out, the eccentricities. But he doesn't ignore hierarchy, and he also gives us a look at Hong Kong and gives a, a particular list uh, to the hierarchy that you had to be at in Hong Kong, and there was a whole seating arrangement whereby uh, you could not be seated above your station. So that's an overview of Quarteng's conception of empire. He doesn't want a sermon on the sins of empire. He rather wants to focus on eccentricities, individualism. Um, though he does give his own forewarning that this can lead to an anarchic individualism. Uh, uh, something that cannot be controlled centrally gives freedom, but it also unleashes chaos. And so that's the beginning of of the the Quarteng obsession there. Now, what what we've ignored there uh, is his uh, Quarteng's financial background, and he wrote, I believe, a thesis on the re some sort of gold rebalancing in the sixteen nineties, and worked for J P Morgan. He has a great interest in the in the history of finance and the and financial crises, and so we'll look at his uh, second work, War and Gold in our next piece, and indeed we'll see if Quarteng has even lasted this uh, fury of a week by then. But we'll look at War and Gold next, however. <laughs>